In order to both promote the reenacting hobby and showcase how it has helped me to uh, gain a further understanding of various historical topics, I thought that it might be fun to make a little video series about some of my best reenacting experiences. And so with this first video in that uh, little uh, uh, theme, if you will, I thought it might be fun to talk about an experience that I had at a Napoleonic reenacting event in the UK. Uh, and this was the time when, after a volley, I was totally in encapsulated in the fog of war. Now, this happened to me at Spetchley Park. Again, it's a Napoleonic reenacting event that was over in the UK, uh, and I was playing at that weekend with the uh, recreated Coldstream Guards 1815. Uh, it's a very good organization. If you happen to be interested in taking up Napoleonic reenacting in the UK, then I would strongly recommend that you uh, look into that organization. I'll include uh, some of their details in the description down below. Always have to advertise, as we know. So on to the actual battle at the event here. Uh, of course, the British units, uh, there were a number of us. The Coldstream Guard were not the only organization there, and uh, all the British regiments had been brigaded together into one very large formation. Or actually, I think it was two very large formations, but we were, you know, standing next to each other. And uh, it was right at the beginning of the battle that we were all lined up on one side of the field, and, uh, you know, after we'd been paraded onto the field and we left base and we're looking at the enemy, the French are in their own or, uh, formations on the other side of the field, and they begin their advance on our position in the same old style. Uh, naturally, the uh, English and, the, and, the, and the, well, all the Allied forces and everything, uh, we, we commence our own advance to uh, push the enemy back. So in ordinary time, the entire line commences there, stepping forward, which is really quite a beautiful sight to see. You know, you just look over a little bit to your right and you just see a massive line all the way down of uh, the legs stretching out and advancing in that very slow, uh, stately, steady pace towards the enemy. And eventually we come to the halt. And we are looking down at a French column, a rather significantly sized one, and it is parading down towards us. Not as terrifying as if it had been a full French column, of course, of a proper scale, uh, but a recreated one. It was still rather intimidating to see because, of course, these men have their, their, their muskets are pointed forward and they're all shouting and they're, sh and they're screaming and everything at us, like, Vive the France and Vive l'Empereur and everything. And they are uh, parading towards us very, very quickly. The command naturally comes, as you may expect, to uh, make ready, so we spring up and, uh, you know, uh, to cock uh, the musket back and everything. The next command is to present. Of course, everyone levels the musket. The man behind me, I'm in the front rank, actually, for this entire thing. The man behind me, of course, locks up, so his musket is going right over my shoulder. And, of course, the men on either side of me are all facing forward. It's, it's a great big, um, you know, you know, the line is bristling with muskets going forward, and you can see all of them as you look around you, as if it's a strange sort of cage uh, keeping you in position. When you are in close order in the Napoleonic era, um, unlike the American War of Independence, where they favored uh, much more fluid mo movement and uh, lighter uh, formation, you know, the, average, the, the man uh, on your side is usually going to be at least an arm's pace away from you in an open order. Um, it's just sort of the dynamic of that war. It's how it worked, uh, given the smaller numbers and the more difficult terrain that they were facing. Things like that. But the Napoleonic Wars, being of such a more intense, of such more, uh, a great more massive of a scale, so to say, uh, very close order tactics were a lot more common because, of course, if you have, say, a front that's you know, uh, half a mile long, and uh, if you have your men in open order, then all of a sudden, if the enemy has a front of equal length, but they have their men in close order, they're going to be able to deliver a great deal more uh, force, a lot more pressure in any one particular point on the field uh, than you are able to. They can shatter through your looser formation a lot more easily. That's the exact same reason why, you know, while, uh, while you know, light infantry and rifleman tactics were quite popular during the Napoleonic period, you know, the, uh, the French voltigeurs or whatever, and the, uh, you know, the British riflemen, the, uh, the dash and zeal of the uh, green jacket, as it is uh, very popularly known. Um, while those sorts of things were very common, they were not the the sole way that the war was, the wars were fought back then. Uh, a light infantry formation, while it could um, certainly, while, the, while they were certainly very important on the field, they were not enough to actually take and seize objectives and push an enemy from the field oftentimes, at least, because, again, if, if the enemy has that much more mass within the same area and they just push, all of a sudden they can deliver, you know, that many more bodies in the field than any particular location. They can really push through your formation quite well. That is the exact point of a column, of an infantry column. If the British are spread out like this, and sure, they have maybe a hundred men, but they're spread all across a great big field because, the, you know, the, uh, the British oftentimes had smaller armies, uh, very, very broadly speaking there. 
But then if you have an infantry column, to say an equal number of men or even more men, as was oftentimes the case, um, and you have them concentrated in a very, uh, very you know, uh, solid block type thing, and you can all of a sudden push through one little part of that line. Well, it doesn't matter if the British have, you know, a lot more men way off on the other side of the battlefield. They are not going to be able to provide assistance for the men who are in the middle of the British line. And so if you can push and shatter that center with a melee, you know, advance as a column does, you know, they're firing as they go, I'm sure, but uh, the idea is, of course, to engage in melee, to get right in there really tight and close. Um, you can break a, um, an enemy line quite easily or quite well, quite efficiently, if you can get that sort of thing to work. And that's, of course, why the British were so keen on fast rates of fire and, and accurate fire, because they needed to try and get that column down before it reached them, because otherwise, uh, complicated things. So that's a, that's a very rough, a very basic way, I think, to describe uh, columns and Napoleonic tactics, but it, it's sort of a baseline to understand what I'm about to explain to you. Now again, I was in the front rank in this formation, and the French column, they weren't over there. They weren't on the other side about to apply pressure to the other team. No, they were in front of me. They were, I was looking them in the eye, not quite in the eye, they were quite far away, but you know, I'm looking at them, at their faces, I can see their hats and everything, their muskets, their, well, the bayonets aren't fixed because of the reenactment, but you get the idea. I would have been able to see the bayonets bristling uh, if they had been attached. And they're, wa they're marching forward, they're advancing towards me. I'm in the front rank, and sure, we're in close order, so I can feel all my comrades around me, but even still, that is a very good way to feel rather alone when you are in the, just right at the forefront and in the center of where the French are coming at you. The command comes to make ready and present. Again, we're, we'll, we'll go back to that moment now. And the French are coming on in the same old style. We're going to attempt to beat them in the same old style, but... Uh, well, we don't know if uh, Wellington's uh, uh, famous line will be applicable today. Uh, of course, a reenactor, we don't know what's actually going to happen in the field. Officers will know how the battle is going to take place, but a reenactor, I'm sorry, we're all reenactors, but uh, the average man, the enlisted man, oftentimes will find out, oh, if we're going to win or lose today, but how that actually takes place, we don't know. The officers do, but the enlisted men don't. It really helps to keep the experience a lot more uh, fresh and surprising, if you will. The French are coming on and we fire against them. And that volley, that was a very crisp volley. As soon as the command to fire came, you just hear the explosions happen all around you as what would have been happening, a great wall of lead is flung forward towards the enemy. In this case, just a whole lot of smoke and because it was a, uh, a reenactment in the UK, a bunch of uh, flaming paper as well. So you get a real crisp volley noise. It was really, really good. Um, after that volley is fired, of course, um, you know, you blink a little bit to get the sulfur out of your eyes and you look forward, you come back down to the prime and load because the command had already been given, reload! Uh, it would be reload in the, by the Napoleonic period, not prime and load as it was early on, but reload. So you come down to the prime, you're reaching back into your cartridge box, you're, you're going through all the motions and, um, you know, the drums are pounding behind us and everything. And we look up, at least I certainly do, I look up, I'm trying to see through the smoke as I'm going through this entire process because they were coming at me, the French were. I want to see what we did to them. I want to see what sort of effect our volley had. And I cannot actually see them. I cannot hear them because of all the chaos that's going on around me, the drums in particular being right behind me. I cannot see them because the smoke from that volley was so thick that, well, I, I could only see the smoke. The volley was so very crisp, and there were so many of us in that line. It was, you know, it wasn't a really large reenactment, but it was certainly uh, significantly scaled compared to something that I get, you know, out in Ohio or whatever. Um, there was a number of people, and we all fired all at once in that double rank. The smoke was so thick, I couldn't see a thing. And as I'm reloading, I'm just staring forward, you know, trying to bring out the ramrod, fumbling with the whole thing, trying to flip it over and ram down the cartridge, because you got to do that in Europe. It's a lot more fun than just pouring the powder down. Uh, ramming down the cartridge, looking forward and seeing smoke just go by, go by, go by. What happened to the French? What, are they about to be on us? Are they just five feet in front of us, about to charge, and am I about to get skewered or something? Or have we felled their officers and their best men, and are they retreating in disorder? What's happening? I don't know, because the fog of war has obscured the actual result of that volley. And I realized in that moment 
just how terrifying an effect like that can be in an actual battle. Imagine, you know, you're being given commands to fire and reload and everything. You don't even see what you're firing at. Because while after a short while, by the time, you know, in that event, we were able or we were ready to fire our second volley, the smoke had cleared. But that's, of course, because we only had, what, a hundred or a little more men actually firing. Say you're at Waterloo and the old guard is advancing on you and there are thousands of men all firing. Of course, they're firing, um, you know, by company. They're not all going to be firing at, in, at once because that would be less efficient. But even still, thousands of men, cannon, everything all around you, firing constantly. You're not going to be able to see a thing. Odds are, if you're aiming at any sort of group, you can barely see them at all if you can see them in any way. You know, the glinting of bayonets, perhaps, but not all that much. The fog of war really does hide the foe from you, and it's very easy to understand, given how obscured a battlefield can be, especially on a day where there is very little, you know, wind to actually clear that smoke. It's very easy to see how common friendly fire would have been as well, and it's absolutely terrifying to imagine. Uh, and you can sort of see as well why officers would always um, take positions behind the lines on hills and everything to try and keep as uh, good an eye on what's going on as they possibly can. Because after a regiment fires a volley, or after a company has or whatever, Odds are you cannot see that company for at least a couple of seconds. And if there's an entire line firing all at once, you can see very quickly how obscured the field can become. I've, I've said that exact same thing a, a great many different ways uh, now. I've been repeating myself, so we'll, we'll try and move on. So anyways, we fire that volley, and I can't see what's happening. Eventually, after a couple of seconds, after a few moments, which feels like forever because you're, you know, trying to reload as fast as you can, you don't know how close they are, the smoke clears, and eventually, I'm at the shoulder at this point, I see just ahead a number of Frenchmen lying, well, Englishmen dressed as Frenchmen, lying dead on the field, uh, having fallen down pretending to be dead because that's how reenacting is, how, how reenacting works. But uh, they fell down and there's a few men, you know, some of the bodies are moving as men are like getting up, adjusting themselves, or pretending to be wounded, which is always really cool when you can see. And the rest of the column has faltered a little bit and eventually they realize that they had suffered too many casualties and they, ca they begin slowly to shift back. It was like that scene out of the movie Waterloo when the old guard, you know, they're shouting out, the old guard is broken and and, uh, flee, flee for your lives or whatever, that sort of thing. It was like that moment, and that was really, really fun, to say the least. It was really cool. Um, absolutely one of the best Napoleonic reenacting experiences that I've ever had. Uh, so yes, if it sounds like fun, by all means, see if you can't get involved. The Coldstream Guards actually has a really good program over in the UK where you do not have to purchase an entire uniform all at once. Indeed, you pay them uh, sort of like a monthly fee and they actually arrange to lend you most, if not all, of the uh, kit. But you can talk with them about that sort of thing if you happen to live in Old England and you're interested in taking up uh, the, the fight against the French and foreign foe. Uh, Yes, but until the next time, of course, my dear viewer, I am and I shall remain your most humble and obedient of servants.